How and why HMCS High Level Saved begins with her sistership, HMCS Athabaskan, and what happened to her during the Second World War. As Sebastian and Hyder were in company one fateful night, April 28th, 29th, 1944. They had engaged with two German Elbing class destroyers about six miles off the Breton coast in northwestern France. As Sebastian was sunk by enemy fire. This event changed my young life forever. 128 of Athabascan's crew were lost. Among them, was my father. I was 13 when my dad was killed. I worshiped him. He was a loving father. His loss was devastating to our family. 44 Athabascan crew members were rescued by HMCS Hyla under the command of Harry the Wolf. A further 83 survivors were taken prisoner by the Germans. What Hyla's CEO, Harry the Wolf, and his crew did that night was extremely brave. My son Mark and I have been to visit the graves of unknown Athabascans at Pluscat in Brittany. The townspeople there keep those graves neat and tidy to this very day. The wreck of Athabascan lies six miles off the Breton coast in 285 feet of very dangerous water. In 2003, my son Mark was one of five to dive on it, and the first Canadian to do so. The images they took were very captivating. It was quite a feeling waiting for my son to return to the surface from my father's war grave. The RCN had provided us with a commemorative plaque Mark placed it on the Athabascan keel on the port side to commemorate all those souls killed in action. Anyhow, that's why I got involved in saving the Hyder. As for the how I got involved in helping save the Hyder from the breakers, it goes back to the RCN's Great Lakes deployment in 1963. Hyder who sent on a farewell tour. By then, I was military editor of the old Toronto Telegram newspaper and a naval reserve officer at HMCS York. I was lucky enough to get on board Hyder for a day sail out of Toronto. On board, I met Trans-Canada Airlines pilot Neil Bruce, lawyer and former naval officer Norm Simpson, Alan Howard, who was a curator of Toronto's Maritime Museum and public relations expert, Dave Kidd. We got talking about what a tragedy it would be for this famous, wonderful ship to be scrapped and turned into razor blades. She deserved better, and so did Canada. We agreed to explore the possibilities. I knew Defence Minister Paul Hayter quite well because of my military writing. So I went directly to him and asked if we might get hold of the ship. Paul Hayter said she would be disposed of through Crown assets, but I should leave it with him. Neil Bruce, who was really the spokesman behind this attempt to save Hyder, also made a few trips to Ottawa to talk to Mr. Hayter. Remember, as scrap, Hyder was probably worth half a million dollars, and that's nearly five million in today's dollars, a lot of money in 1963 far beyond what we might raise. In due time, Paul Hayter worked out something which took Crown assets out of the picture. We could get the ship for $20,000 to be paid over 10 years, no interest, and the first payment deferred a year. That's about $175,000 in today's money. Additional conditions included that we would have to pick up Hayter in Sulaw, Quebec from the Navy, and also pledged to keep her in good condition so the government could have her back if needed for national defense. 
that was the wrinkle which allowed us to bypass crown assets. We were in business. Norm Sensor did all the legal work for Donald in setting up Hyde Incorporated, and we all put our homes up at the bank to finance throwing her from Sorrel to Toronto, $6,000 plus $2,500 for insurance, about sixty-five grand in today's money. I remember calling my wife Jane and telling her I just put our house up as collateral at the bank, but we owned one-fifth of the destroyer. There was dead silence for a few heartbeats, and then she said, whoopee. To which I replied, yes, honey, but Ariel Nassus, the Greek shipping tycoon, only owns a frigate. Well, because we were now a registered charity, we could start raising funds. Dave Kidd went to work on that. HMC Historic agreed to special duty for a crew of 18 reservists to go to Sorrel and pick up Hyla from the Navy in mid-August 1964. Meanwhile, the partners worked their magic for us to get permission to berth the ship at the foot of York Street in Toronto Harbor. Our reserve crew went to Montreal by train, turning the sleeper car into something that looked like a Second World War troop train draft. We even convinced the porter that our 120 volt generator was handbaggers. We were met in Montreal by a Navy bus, which drove us to Sorel, where Hyla was waiting. The Navy had crammed her with artifacts from the Second World War, hammocks, hat boxes, dummy ammunition, and even a cutaway model of a torpedo. All things we could use in setting up displays for the public. As the only member of Hyla Incorporated to make the trip to Sorrel, I signed for the ship, and she was ours. Lieutenant Commander Jack McFoy was our electrical officer. We tied down the generator behind B turret, Jack built the ship's emergency wiring system, and we had power. Here's a picture of our crew. That's me, front, far left, then Jack McQuarrie, followed by Bill Wilson, who was then our executive officer at HMCS York, and now the CEO of Ida, and far right, Bob Ellis. I was the quarterback officer, and Bob Ellis was the focal officer. We set up half a dozen common stoves in the boardroom flats, and Petty Officer Bill Lloyd became the cook, and an extremely good one. We had thoughtfully brought along some rum, so we could have a regular up spirits for everyone in the wardroom. And away we went. Well, it was heavy work, handling the blinds as we locked through the seaway, and we saw to it that Hyda did not even scratch paint going through the lock. We all handled blinds. Jack McCory had brought along a set of two-way radios, and we had given two to the tug master. In true service fashion, Bill Wilson would call up the tugs with, Tug with Chalester, Tug with Chalester, this is warship pilot, come in the Chalester. These two French-Canadian tug skippers pulled up with us for about half an hour, and then they turned off their radios. Once through the seaway locks, one of the tugs left us. I remember waking up one morning to discover that we were anchored in the St. Lawrence in deep fog. We hadn't a clue where we were. Picture Bill Wilson leaning over the rail with an extra road map as mystified pleasure boats emerged from the fog, amazed at a tribal class destroyer in their river, while Bill Wilson asked, where are we? Finally, the fog cleared, and we proceeded into Lake Ontario. There was a west wind creating a bit of a sea, and Hyla pitched the back as though she was eager to get to her new life. We anchored off Toronto's Western Gap just as the exhibition fireworks went off. We played with the searchlight that Jack McCoy had flashed up, and we waved at occasional curious motorboats. We also got ready to dress ship overall for the next day's official arrival. It was just a great entry the next morning as the tug took us through the western gap in the Toronto Harbor and the armada of pleasure boats met us, horns and sirens sounding. A fireboat spewed huge arcs of water over multiple, multiple hoses. At the York Street jetty waiting for us were Harry DeWolf, Bob Brown, and J.A. Charles, all former CEOs of Hyla plus Defence Minister Paul Heyer 
and for all who may have Phil Gibbons. Now we have to throw down the business. There were surprises in store for us, however. In early autumn 1964, HMS Britannia brought Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip to Charlottetown, PEI, to mark the centennial of the Charlottetown Conference that resulted in the creation of Canada. I was one of more than 100 newspeople assigned to cover the visit. I had a bit of an inside track because an acquaintance was in charge of RCMP Marine Security. When the Charlottetown part of the visit ended, Britannia, with Her Majesty and His Royal Highness, embarked, sailed on to Quebec City. I got a berth in HMCS Terra Nova, one of the escorting destroyers. Coverage in Quebec City for journalists was a real zoo, with some compensations. There was to be a reception on Britannia for some of the newspeople covering the visit, and I was fortunate enough to get an invitation. That was my chance to speak with former Royal Naval Officer Prince Philip. I made a beeline for him right away and explained what we were doing with the Hyla, and he was very interested. Then I said, Your Highness, it would be wonderful if you could become our patient. He veered back and he said, You can't ask me that sort of thing. You have to go through proper channels. And then he leaned forward and he said, And this is how you do it. I followed his advice, and a couple of months later, he was our patient, which certainly made it easier to get corporate donations for Hyda, Inc. In 1966, Prince Philip made a visit to Geronimo. He complained that there was no visit for the Hyda scheduled for him. So his handlers gave him 15 minutes. He came, and he spent almost two hours with us. We served him rum in the wardroom, and he climbed all over the ship, thoroughly enjoying himself. Three years after that, Prince Philip was in Ottawa, and I met him at a reception at Rideau Hall. As soon as he saw me, he grabbed my arm and he said, how's the highlight? So I updated him. Two years later, the same thing happened. Well, it sure wasn't all that kind of glory. The first winter we had hired in Toronto, we discovered a serious problem. A warship alongside in fresh water with no power in winter faces the danger of water in the tube hull fittings freezing, expanding, and cracking the hull. That meant we had to keep water flowing through each opening, and that meant running the pumps 24-7 in a sometimes scary attempt to keep that ship afloat. At one time, we had five feet of water in the engine room. We five Hyda Inc. members were often called in the middle of these winter nights to deal with problems. Come spring, Norm Simpson got hold of his friend Scott Meiser, who owned Colonial Shipping Lines and the Port Weller Drive Up. Meisner said that he would pull Hyda to Port Weller, dry lock it, and weld shut all the openings and then tow her back for $20,000. What a gift. Commercially, something like that would have cost at least five times that amount, nearly $900,000 in today's dollars. By 1970, things had become tight for us financially, and Hyda needed some work. I was stationed in Ottawa by then and somewhat out of the loop. We discussed things, and Norm Simpson said he thought the Ontario government might help. After all, Premier John Robarts was a former naval officer. Yes, the Ontario government was interested, and they agreed to take control of Hyda, assisted by friends of Hyda and the volunteers from HMCS York. Hyda would become the jewel of Ontario Place. I remember getting a release from the bank on the wing of our house when Ontario government took control of Hyda. Hyda was a major attraction at Ontario Place for more than three decades until Heritage Minister responsible for Parks Canada, Sheila Cox, took her to Hamilton, where Hyda is birthed today at HMCS Fire.
When Heide was proclaimed the ceremonial flagship of the RCN, I wrote to Prince Philip at Buckingham Palace to tell him and received a lovely letter back two weeks later saying that our efforts had been vindicated. Parks Canada wanted to do something big and meaningful and organized a Speed Bay event. They made special blank rounds filled with black powder for the four-inch guns. With a turret trained to starboard toward New York State, they fired a salvo. It was quite loud. There were sailors from the three area Naval Reserve Divisions on parade, including HMCS York. The ship seemed to raise steam again, smoke blowing out of the main funnel. And the Kovla aircraft did a fly past. It was simply magical, particularly when the sirens went off. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Best of all, the park staff invited two hereditary chiefs of the seagoing Haida Nation from the West Coast to right a historical wrong. No one of the Haida Nation had ever had direct contact with their namesake ship in her 75 years of existence. Two hereditary chiefs spoke with pride and had a powerful message. In the course of history, there's always these conflicts that occur and people want to do this and that and take possession of this and that. And there is always some conflict somewhere. And the Hydra was built to engage in that sort of a conflict. And we've been, I guess it follows the uh, tradition of the Hydra Nation where we were in many, many conflicts over the years. And at the end of the, um, end of the time, we have learned very quickly that there are no winners in these conflicts. There are no winners in the war. So we developed a, a different approach. We tried to compromise and get along with people and uh, build relationships and do things together that are more productive than trying to do things on our own because it just doesn't work that way. It was very moving. It was a special moment when Vice Admiral Lloyd spontaneously ordered the hoisting of the Haida Nation flag to the foremast port side yard on the Haida. There wasn't a dry eye in the house. The Haida Nation flag still flies today as a symbol of that respect. In the evening, there was a beautiful commemorative ceremony to honor those lost during the Battle of the Atlantic. As the names of those lost at sea scrolled up on the highest hull, I saw that of my own father appear. My kids and I wept as it brought everything back full circle, 75 years on. As a country, we made the right decision to save this ship. The Parks Canada staff and the Friends of Hyder are just as passionate about telling her story as I am. She's in great hands now, and that makes me happy. I want to thank the Royal Canadian Navy for this opportunity to tell my story about HMCS Hyla. Thank you, RCN.